Hi, and welcome to our second lesson video. Now, today's lesson is going to be about safety. And the video, well, is a two-parter. Part one is going to have to do with uh, general shop safety. And part two, well, we're going to be looking more specifically at safety related to different types of machine tools. But before we get into that, I'd like to read a short excerpt from this book. And this is an old copy, 1930s, 40s, and 50s articles collated into the popular mechanics encyclopedia. And what I'm going to read, well, has to do with cleaning masonry. And bizarrely enough, it's a good way to get into safety. So, the article says, Removing copper stains from limestone and cement. Stains which form on masonry, stone or concrete blocks, where water from copper downspouts, gutters, bronze plaques, or house numbers drip, can be removed by washing the stone with a solution of potassium cyanide. Potassium cyanide is a deadly poison and should, of course, be used with great care. No kidding. It should not be allowed to get on the skin as it is likely to be absorbed through cuts and abrasions. Well, we can see by that article that the notion of safety has changed quite a bit. Back then, just mentioning it casually was all that was required. And if you didn't heed the warning, well, tough noogies. Today, well, we're enveloped by a safety cocoon. Products and uh, machines and, well, everything we use, even toasters, are produced with safety in mind and really are made to be as safe as possible. And, well, that can have a perverse effect. In the 1970s, minor hockey league associations introduced new rules to reduce the great number of facial injuries. I mean, it was normal to suppose that by instituting mandatory face shield rules, well, that facial injuries would be reduced. And sadly, that was the case. Why sadly? Well, because of the perverse effect. The reduction in facial injuries was accompanied by an increase in neck injuries and spinal injuries. And why is that? Well, because the hockey players felt invulnerable. They were better protected and, well, didn't think so much about playing even rougher. So that is a perverse effect of a safety regulation, well, of any regulation. Because it reduces our fear, and fear is very important. In the shop, fear is important. I mean, it heightens our awareness and prepares us to react quickly should something go wrong. A person that has no fear whatsoever when performing a machining operation, well, is a menace to him or herself and to the people around them. Fear is very important. So, I guess it would be safe to say that no fear equals no brains. The machine shop is not, by definition, a safe place to be. I mean, it's packed full of machines that can injure and maim, and even a few of them that could kill. Now, if this doesn't inspire any fear in you, well, maybe you've chosen the wrong sphere of activity. Now, I've been working in shops all my life, and every time I come to turn on a machine tool, well, I say to myself consciously, I have ten fingers and two eyes, and I want to finish this job with all of my body parts intact. Now, we humans all have bad habits. Well, maybe not me, but everyone else does. And some of those bad habits are very dangerous in the shop. The first habit that we have to avoid in the shop is the human habit of trying to catch expensive things that are falling. Now, if I drop 
or nudge a micrometer off of the milling table, I will more than likely try to catch it or stick my foot under it to soften the blow and maybe save the tool because it was expensive and well maybe it has sentimental value. I don't know. But it is a very very bad habit to have because if we get used to doing that it becomes a reflex and maybe the next time I drop a large wrench or the next time I drop a machine vise or the next time that I might drop a heavy bar of steel I may very well stick my foot under it to soften the blow. Now it may soften the blow for the machine vise but I will more than likely never walk straight again. In the machine shop it's important to let falling things fall and it's no fun. It's even something that we feel is aggresses our senses. Here's a large wrench. I hate that sound. We want to avoid it, but we have to let it be. As John Lennon said, let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Oh, let it be. The next habit we're going to want to waste well, is what I've come to call over the years the catching the bus syndrome. And what does that mean? Well, imagine that you're crossing the street. And once you're well engaged in the street, you turn to your left to see that there's a city bus coming quite quickly. So quickly that you will not manage to get out of the way. What do you do? You turn, you face the bus, and... 3D effect, you stick your arms out. Ooh, scary. You're trying to push the danger away, or you're trying to catch the bus. Now, it is obvious that you're going to lose that battle, but that doesn't stop you from sticking your arms out anyway. So, great, how does the bus analogy apply to the shop? Well, imagine that you're working on a mill or on a lathe. Well, let's say a lathe and your chuck becomes loose and you notice that it's coming off the spindle and it's turning at a high RPM. Many people, due to the catching the bus syndrome, will want to catch the three-jaw chuck and it just won't work. Well, how do I break this habit? We break the habit by practice and by knowing about the problem. So, I'm in front of a machine, something goes wrong, what do I do? Most people say, hit the kill switch. No, that's too easy. And it keeps you in proximity to the problem. What you need to do is, something goes wrong, you put your hands away, to your back, away from the danger. You have to do that consciously. You put them back, you take a step back, you take a breath. You look for the kill switch and you kill it. Now, if whatever's happening is major and very dangerous, well, you don't look for the kill switch, you get out of there. You'll fix the problem after. Now, if you try and get your hands into it, you will not win that fight. Another good habit to develop is the habit of never adjusting a machine unless it is turned off by at least two switches. And what is adjusting? Well, installing a cutting tool, installing a vise, installing a part, changing a pulley or a belt, anything that has to do with adjusting a machine turned off by two switches for safety. Well, your machine only has one switch. In that case, turn off the switch and unplug it. Very important. In the shop, you want to avoid quick or rapid movements. You want to work at a safe and steady pace. A bit like the tortoise and the hare story. I wouldn't know. I have very little hair. You also want to get used to working standing up and never leaning on a machine, he said, as he leans on the machine. Obviously, I mean when the machine is running. Well, why is that? Well, leaning on the machine 
well, makes you less alert. It is much more a relaxed position or stance. And also it places you in that danger zone, close to what's going on, like Tom Cruise. Now, sitting is a problem, again, because it lowers the height of your face and places your face in that danger zone, Top Gun. But it is also a very relaxed position and prone to dozing off, so very dangerous. But there's another problem with sitting, and that is that it positions your legs in a way that exposes them to crushing accidents. Uh, example, legs under a milling table that is feeding downward. Really not pretty. No, standing is better because obviously your legs have to be directly under you. It's important to get used to keeping your work area clean. Nothing on the ground to slip or trip on. No piles of tools on your machine that can fall off. Be aware of what's going on around you. Now you may very well be working safely, but the next person over might be lining up for a disaster and that tool that's going to go flying might end up hitting you. So be well aware of what's going on. Have you ever heard of RTFB? It's short for read the f***ing book. Now it's important to read up on and to get acquainted with a machine tool before you turn it on. So those manuals, they're not just there to take up space in a filing cabinet. They are there to be read. It is a good habit to get used to not suffering in silence. For some bizarre reason, many people, mostly men, tend to clam up when something goes wrong. And that's really not the thing to do. You want other people to be able to intervene and help you out. And for that, well, they have to know that there is a problem. And the quicker, the better. Now, when I was teaching, for the first two or three weeks of the first semester, I would get the class to, after roll call, let out a good yell. So, now's a good time to practice, or start practicing. So, with me, on three. One, two, three. Hey! That felt pretty good. Oh yeah, and for my buddy up in Greenland who tends to doze off during my videos because, hey, I'm such a lively teacher, well, Jim, wake up! Another important habit is to never, 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 ever leave a chuck key in the chuck. Never. And there's a way to get used to not doing that. And that is to always use the same hand. Now, I am right-handed. And that means that I hold my chuck key with my right hand. Now, I have a habit of always doing that. And I've made sure that I never let go of the chuck key unless it is placed in its proper position. And that means that I cannot forget it or leave it in the chuck. It's just a habit you got to get used to doing. So why the right hand? Well, there's a second habit that you develop parallel to the first, and that is that you always turn the machine on with the same hand that you use to hold the chuck key. And that means that it would be impossible to turn on the machine if your chuck key is in the chuck and you are still holding it. That sounds bizarre or odd or even a little stupid, but it isn't. It happens regularly and one quite frequent accident is that in the shop is people turning on, let's say, the lathe as they're still holding the chuck key. Obviously, major injury ensues. You should always let a machine stop completely. Because it's not because you hit the switch that it's not still moving. So you have to let it stop completely before doing anything. That includes cleaning it. That includes adjusting a tool. That includes removing a part. 
we do not touch anything until the machine has completely stopped. It's important that a machine tool be operated by only one person. You do not team operate a machine tool. Now, teams can work on machine tools because there could be a setup person and an operator, and there's no problem with that. But what we do not want is one person turning on the machine while the other person is still adjusting the machine. If you want to keep them other than in a box, it is crucial to never, never, never let your fingers get close to a moving cutting tool. Never! The last habit I would like to talk about today is the habit of never letting someone seek medical attention on their own if they're injured in the shop. If someone is injured in the shop, what well, you should or someone should escort them or accompany them to the first aid station or to the nurse's office or to the hospital depending on the severity of the injury. And that doesn't mean to vaguely walk 10 feet behind the person. That means to hold them by the arm and to escort them to first aid. Now, I don't care how big and strong you think you are. Anyone can pass out if they get a good cut. And well, that's just the way life is. And I have seen big, strong, tough guys pass out and fall very hard. Now, if you fall face first, unconscious, that means without protection, on a cement floor, well, the injuries that you sustain are going to be probably worse than the cut that you had to start with. So it is very important. Always accompany someone to first aid. Now, those were good habits to adopt, but besides habits, there's rules as well. And here are the basic rules for working in a machine shop. First, eye protection. Always wear your eye protection in the shop. And this is a pair of glasses, but they are not safety glasses. This, with their side shields, are an approved pair of safety glasses. The lenses are impact resistant and they are of a large diameter. So this is safety glasses and they must be worn when working in the shop. Now, this is my home shop. I work in here by myself, no other workers around. So if I'm not working, nothing is going on. And that means that I can have the luxury of wearing my reading glasses when I'm doing general things around the shop, such as turning or filming a video. But when I work, I wear my safety glasses. Now, if you are in a shop where other people work as well, well, you have to wear your safety glasses all the time because it might not be what you're doing that causes the injury. It could be what someone else is doing. I mean, things fly around and sometimes they cover a great distance. Second rule, steel toe and anti-skid shoes or boots must be worn at all times. And I don't think this requires any explanation. Clothing in the shop must conform to these requirements. Clothing should be easily torn and fire resistant. Cotton is preferable. Loose-fitting clothes that can be entangled in machine parts must not be worn. It's no time to have a boo-boo or some large piece of clothing that can easily be drawn into moving parts. I mean, you're just running after trouble. But if they are dragged into a machine, you want them to be of a material that's easily torn. And the reason, well, is obvious, so you can free yourself from that predicament. Long sleeves should be worn rolled up above the elbow. Short sleeves are preferred. Pants must cover the top of the boots or shoes. No cuffs and no shorts allowed. You do not want hot chips getting into your shoes or boots, and you don't want hot chips getting into the cuffs of your pants and catching fire. 
rings, watches, bracelets, neckties, belts, and all other accessories that can cause or aggravate an accident must be avoided. Long hair, more than two inches, I don't have a problem with that, must be controlled with a cap or bonnet. Ponytails and braids are not acceptable. As far as alcohol, drugs, and prescription drugs go, if the law or your doctor says that you are not allowed to drive, well, you should not be working or operating machines in the shop. In order to avoid injuring others, and this obviously only goes for people who work in shops with other people, always report defective machines to the supervisor. This will obviously help others to not find out the hard way that the machine is broken. The shop should be a fun place to be. However, it is important to always remember that it is a dangerous place. So roughhousing and pranks are never welcome. It is recommended to never work alone in the shop. Now, for home shops, an intercom system and letting someone nearby know that you are working in the shop will help to keep things safe. Now, if you are in your home shop, and obviously you're going to be working alone, I do as well, but what do I do to cover all my bases? Well, for a few bucks I bought a set of these small walkie-talkies with clips. I can clip onto my belt, and I can leave in intercom mode, and that means that the other person, usually my wife down at the house, well, can hear what's going on. And should I scream for help? Well, she can come and give me a hand. Very important. If you are alone, be able to communicate. Always follow the safety recommendations and instructions provided with your equipment. If you do not have these documents, contact the manufacturer to obtain a copy. Never render inoperative the safety features of your equipment. Manufacturers go out of their way to make safe machines. When they incorporate a safety feature, it's because it is required. Now, those were the basic shop rules. Now, let's look at the last subject for today's lesson, and I know it's a long one, and that is basic rules to follow when moving heavy objects. Lifting and moving heavy objects are responsible for many shop injuries. It is not necessary to be incredibly strong to move heavy objects safely. Common sense and following these safety rules will help you get things where they need to be. First, be conservative and realistic when evaluating an object's weight. Always suppose that it will be heavier than you think. Secondly, Plan your move. Make sure that the path that joins where your part is to where it needs to be is clear of obstacles and anything that can be a problem. Plan the place where the part will rest after the move, before you move it. Thirdly, pain can change the weight of an object. Even a relatively light object can become heavy if it is difficult to hold. Things that have odd shapes, things that don't have good gripping surfaces, and things that have sharp edges can surprise you since they can be easy to lift but very difficult to hold. Fourthly, lift with your legs and not your back. Your back must remain straight and vertical when lifting. No torsion allowed either. Fifthly, trust your brains more than your brawn. If you have any doubt about a lift, use the appropriate equipment, hydraulic tables, roller cranes, floor jacks, etc. And finally, lifting heavy objects should be a solo job. Communication problems can make team lifting very dangerous. I recommend that you use equipment rather than buddies. You can damage equipment, but you can't kill it. Well, that completes part one of our lesson two video that's all about safety. In part two of lesson two, well, we'll be looking at safety more specific to different machine types. Now, I hope you enjoyed this video. But more important than that, 
I really, really hope that you are going to work safely. It's very important. So, until we meet again, have fun. Be safe. You, be safe. And happy machining.